Welcome to today's APSC CME CAFLAB Educational Series for Fellows in Training. Today's session is on left main bifurcation, a date stamp for today, 16 July 2021 on a Friday, 3 p.m. Singapore time. We're very proud to host this event at Tan Tok Seng today for the live case presentation. This session is endorsed by the Singapore Cardiac Society, the Asian Pacific Society of Interventional Cardiology, CME accredited by EBEC in collaboration with Medtronic. My name is Jack, your host and uh, chair for today from Singapore, the current president for the Asian Pacific Society of Cardiology. We're also very happy to be hosted for the live case presentation to Thunder Singh Hospital, the CAFLAT team. Our first speaker of the day is Dr. Fahim Jeffrey a good friend of uh, ours at Tan Singh General Hospital. He's going to speak to us on a single stent crossover in left main PCI. Our two speakers, other two speakers include Professor Goran Stankovic at the Faculty of Medicine University of Belgrade at Serbia. He's going to speak to us on the review of the latest trial in left main PCI. Dr. Nick Cruz, Interventional cardiologist at St. Luke's Global Heart Institute, Philippines, is going to speak to us on pharmacotherapy regime in left main stenting. In the cath lab in Tan Singh, we have two of our operators, Dr. Ho Hee Hua, senior cardiologist at the Department of Cardiology, Tan Singh Hospital, together with his colleague, Dr. Jason Lowe, who is going to demonstrate to us today's session on left main bifurcation PCI. We have a group of uh, esteemed panelists today, including Dr. Kumara from IJM Malaysia, Dr. Raj from Glen Eagles, Brunei, Dr. Kotaro Obanai from uh, Japan, and my good colleague, Professor KK Yo from Singapore. A disclaimer, the content of the webinar is copyrighted and should not be distributed without the permission of APSC. The views and opinions expressed in the webinar are those of the faculty members and do not necessarily represent those of the APSC. This content is currently made available live stream through Wonder, APSC Facebook and YouTube pages. For Singapore registered physicians, CME points will be submitted for attendees who are connected throughout the whole duration of the webinar. EBEC grants CME points for regional attendees who attend the full session you will receive your certificate of attendance upon completing a survey sent by email. For attendees calling in live, uh, please feel free to key in your Q&A questions if you have. And a pitch for upcoming APSC CME webinars. On the 21st of July, we have a consensus uh, presentation on the use of MicroClip for MR, the when, who, and how of it. 12th August, we have a session on heart failure and diabetes, a review of the current landscape and the future. 14 August, 2021, we have a transcontinental coronary imaging and physiology club sharing. Again, a fellow's focus on the basics. I want to state the learning objectives for today's two hour session. First, we want to choose the right patient for provisional left main PCI. Second, we want to share the technical tips and tricks for a successful provisional left main PCI. And lastly, we want to share insights on the current advances and latest data in the management of left main bifurcation. So let's get started. And I'd like to welcome our first speaker, Dr. Fahim, to share his talk on the single stand crossover in left main PCI. Fahim, please. Thank you, Jack. Uh, let me try to um, share my screen. Um, are you all able to hear me and uh, and see my slides? Loud and clear. Please go ahead. Yes. Super. Um, just trying to get my pointer. Yeah, so thank, thank you, Jack, and I pre appreciate the opportunity to speak here. Um, my job over the next 10 odd minutes is to talk about single stent crossover in left main PCI and just sort of share some thought processes as well as tips and tricks. And hopefully this will, some of this will be useful for uh, fellows in training. Um, 
for this talk, let me just uh, at the outset state that provisional refers to the circumflex. Um, you know, there are rare cases when we actually stent the left main into the circumflex and the LED becomes a side branch. But the same concepts will apply even if the LED is, is the side branch, um, you know, uh, and, you know, the, the same ideas would apply. Now, an important uh, basic issue with left main PCI is that not all left main disease is actually the same. Um, you know, we have simple left main disease, which involves the osteum and the mid shaft. And that's not what the, the focus of this talk is. We're really talking about the majority of left main disease, which is distal and therefore complex, and it involves the side branch vis-a-vis -vis the circumflex. Now, why is single stent crossover not desirable? I mean, why are we having this talk when we're talking about choosing patients, the right kind of patient? Um, so why single stent uh, you know, crossover not desirable? And that's for several reasons. For starters, uh, you know, you're not deliver, delivering definitive therapy of the side branch. At the end of the day, most of the time, there is some disease at the side branch, and you're not, you know, putting a stent over there. Um, then there is some data, you know, some heavy-duty heavy, heavy duty data, vis-a-vis -vis the DK Crush 5 uh, trial and the definition study, uh, where the DK Crush 5, uh, you know, random in randomized fashion compared provisional versus DK Crush for both simple as well as complex lesions and showed that actually the DK crush upfront two stent strategy was better than provisional. Uh, and then the definition two study, which was largely on all bifurcations, but at least 30% of them were left mains, showed that when you choose patients based on some major criteria vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, as listed over here, side branch length, uh, more than 10 and the side branch diameter stenosis more than 70 with other concomitant criteria like calcification, et cetera. A two stent strategy, strategy, largely DK crush was better than provisional. And you can see that in orange, the provisional arm had more TLR, target vessel MI and target lesion failure. Um, another reason is cosmetics. And while that may sound kind of silly and naive, the fact is that the results with provisional almost never look as cosmetically pleasing to uh, to the uh, to the eye as a, uh, you know as a two cent strategy would. Um, and then the other aspect is that when you have to do rescue or bailout stenting, it is at times relatively painful and it is less well studied systematically. In other words, we don't know what the best way is to rescue a side branch, which technique, so on and so forth. The next question to ask is that why is single stent crossover desirable? So why do we want to do it, even though there are some undesirable features uh, of the technique? And one is that it simplifies the procedure for obvious reasons. You all you have to do is put one stent and, you, and, you, and you're done. You go home. It also, in some ways, uh, simplifies the DAP regimen because when you've done a simple procedure, you're not worried about extending DAP, and this is important when patients are at high bleeding risk. And the overall data supports the provisional approach now in randomized fashion. You have the EBC main, which uh, Dr. Stankovic is going to talk about, and so I'm not going to spend too much spend time on that. And this is despite the cosmetics, as I mentioned earlier. And I think it's important to remember, especially for fellows, that PCI is not cosmetic surgery; it is consequential therapy. We really aren't trying to get the prettiest picture of the in the world. We just want to do what's best for the patient. And this is observational data that shows you know, uh, uniformly that the provisional approach is better than the, than the uh, two-stand approach. Of course, there with, with observational data, you run into issues with selection bias. And then the EBC main, which again, I'm not gonna spend too much time on because the next speaker is gonna be talking about this in detail. But in, in the EBC main, the provisional protocol involved you know, doing a, re, doing a part recross and then a almost mandatory kissing balloon, balloon inflation. And what they were able to show is that if you look at the uh, provisional arm in red versus the, you know, the, the, sorry, if you look at the two stent arm in red versus the provisional arm in blue, there was essentially not, no significant differences. Uh, and so the randomized data suggests that provisional is essentially as good as a two stent strategy. So why go through the headache? Now, 
which cases are ideally suited for provisional? And that's where you as operators have to make the, some, the, those selection choices because you have two techniques, both of them have their pros and cons. And this is sort of how I think of it, that when you have a side branch, again, we're talking about the circumflex for this talk, when it's small and diminutive or it's diffusely diseased or it's a CTO or there's a wide left main circumflex angle, or, you know, uh, when the circumflex is totally normal with the plaque burden on IVUS less than 50%, or you have a patient that is high bleeding risk where it is a genuine issue of treating, you know, giving DAPT uh, in this patient. Uh, these are the cases that are ideally suited for a provisional approach. And so if you look at it, then your computation or your decision-making involves looking at the anatomy but also looking at the patient. And that's what we do as doctors. We look at both the anatomy and we look at the patient. As a, con as a contrast to that, you also have to then ask the question, which patients are least suited for provisional? And that's sort of this group, you know, patients with a large circumflex, with severe osteal disease, as you can see over here, or long, moderate osteal disease. So maybe not as short as this, but long and moderate with heavy plaque burden at the ostium of the circumflex by IVUS. Um, or if you have a circumflex that is very difficult to wire, where rescuing it after stenting across might become a nightmare. Or you have a patient who's relatively low bleeding risk. These are the patients, again, looking at anatomy and patient characteristics who would be more suited for a two-strand approach rather than provisional. There are, of course, some gray zones to this selection. For example, Skill set is very important. If you have an operator whose two stent skill set is relatively mediocre, doesn't he's not confident about his ability to do a good job of putting in two stents, then I would really honestly say it's probably best that he, he or she not do the case. But if you must do, it's probably best to stick with provisional because, and I will say this several times during this talk, nothing is worse than a poorly done two stent uh, procedure. Nothing is worse than that. And so it is much better rather that you just do provisional rather than a poorly done two stent procedure. Also expansion issues. When the circumflex ought to be stented based on the, the anatomical criteria, but you cannot expand the circumflex with a balloon or you've not been able to do plaque modification or plaque modification is not feasible and you've not been able to expand the, the, the circumflex, it is probably best to stick with provisional because if you put a stent there, it'll be under expanded the risk of stent thrombosis will be high. And again, the same thing, nothing is worse than a poorly done two stent uh, procedure. And then of course, stability. And this is kind of a double-edged sword. sword. When you have an unstable patient, stenting across and losing the circumflex can be a disaster. But at the same time, an unstable patient is not, so, not likely to tolerate a complex two stent procedure very well. And so that's where you have to find the sweet spot and use your clinical judgment to approach it. Now, of course, there are ways to uh, increase the robustness of your provisional procedure, of course, with the right selection, you know, make sure you wire the circumflex no matter what, and understand the anatomical issues. Remember that a pinched vessel is not always a compromised vessel. If you look at it on the panel in the right side, you start with a circular lumen, then you get carina shift and you get an oval lumen. And the oval lumen is narrow in the horizontal axis, but it's pretty wide in the vertical axis. And these, the, the area is often okay. And so these, these vessels, when you do an FFR, often they are negative, even if they look kind of pinched and compromised. What is relatively unclear is the, the role of routine kissing balloon inflation. Hopefully, Dr. Stankovic will talk more about it because that was routinely done in the EBC main. And what is also unclear is that could you do a balloon angioplasty and then drug-coated balloon angioplasty of the side branch uh, as, as an approach? It's not been systematically studied. In our practice, we do that fairly often. And that's something that we can certainly discuss. What are your rescue options? If your side branch, the circumflex goes down in a ball of flames, well, you have one is to leave it if it's just too small. You can do kissing balloon and repeat prolonged kissing balloon inflation to, to, get, to sort of improve it. And then you have various stenting techniques vis-a-vis -vis tap, culotte, reverse crush. And basically it comes down to a choice of what you're used to. And I will show you a case of a reverse crush just as, just as an example. So now let's look at quickly in the next five minutes, a couple of cases. This is a 66 year old man with the usual risk factors who had a PCI three months ago and then came back with a non-STEMI. And so this is what happened three months ago. There was a tight right that was stented. 
with a lot of moderate disease proximally left alone. And this is his left side, which is kind of concerning. The circumflex is occluded, the left main is long and diffuse, and there was an LED lesion that was stented. Uh, and you know, that's just sort of, sort of shown over here. Everything was left. Not surprisingly, the patient came back with a non-STEMI. And the right side, the diffuse disease persisted, maybe slightly more prominent, but the FFR and RFR were negative. But on the left side, it just looked terrible. You can see that there is a tight lesion in the mid LED, proximal to the old stent, and then the whole LED and left main is diffusely diseased. So, and this is just another view. You can see the circumflex is occluded. It's small and diminutive. So based on that, we, approved, we of course offered the patient cabbage, which he declined, and we went ahead and uh, adopted a provisional approach with left main guidance. So we wired the LED in the cir circumflex, dilated, and then stented across the, the, you know, in the left main, across the circumflex, then did a part. And you can notice that there's this, this floating wire, or what, I, what we call an anchor wire, to keep the guide away from the osteal left main, which was stented to protect the stent. And then this is the final result where the, you know, the numbers were excellent on IVUS with excellent minimal stent uh, areas. So this is an example where provisional worked very well. The circumflex looks unchanged. We weren't concerned. We just wanted to keep it open. Now, on the other hand, this is a slightly different scenario where you have a 66-year-old man who's mentally challenged as a non-STEMI. And this is one patient where you have compliance issues. You really don't want to do a two-stand technique if you can. And I'll show you where we, our hands were tied. So here we have diffuse LED disease extending into the osteum. We have a pretty normal looking circumflex at the osteum on a moderate mid-circumflex lesion. The circumflex was IFR and FFR negative, so not significant. And the osteum of the circumflex on IVUS had a good area with a very low plaque burden, less than 50%. The LED, on the other hand, had diffuse disease and was positive by both FFR and our IFR. So what did we do? We decided on provisional. Uh, we went ahead and stented the LED into the left main. And I'm not going to go through all those steps, but that's what we did. And you notice then, after stenting and post-dilating and doing part and all those usual good steps, you look at the circumflex and it starts looking ugly. And I'll show you a blow up of this. The circumflex looks ugly. But as I mentioned to you, the circumflex can sometimes be uh, you know, misleading. So we put a pressure wire. And this is an FFR wire going in easily. The FFR wire is now being pulled back to equalize. And basically after that, our FFR was low at 0.62. Remember, it was normal before we stented. So because of this, we were forced to stent it. And what I did was I, I used a reverse crush technique. So we stented the mid cirque with a, with a stent and then put a stent from the ostium of the cirque to the mid vessel. And notice here that we have the stent position just within the uh, you know, the, the side branch stand posi position just within the main branch. And that's sort of, you know, looking at the key components of reverse crush or tap. You have your stent with the markers just protruding and you have a balloon in the main vessel. That's key. And that's sort of a blow up of that. We went ahead and deployed the stent slowly. And after deploying the stent, we, uh, you know, as you can see, it's deployed here. We crushed it. I don't know why this crush uh, picture is not playing, but we crushed it with a big balloon and then rewired, as you can see over here, and did our final kissing balloon, and the final result, and then, sorry, did a repart, and this is the final result, which was quite satisfactory. Here is an example of going in with the provisional strategy, but it failed, and we verified that by F FFR, and went ahead and had to rescue it, and we used the reverse crush technique. So what, what, can, I what can we conclude from this? Well, we can conclude that provisional stenting of the circumflex is an option in treating left main bifurcation lesions. Uh, the decision-making involves the uh, assessing the anatomy and the patient. Some anatomies, especially the really complex ones, you really need to go to stand. And with some patients where there's frailty, compliance, bleeding risk, you really must go provisional unless you don't have an option. And for a lot, you can go either way. Certainly based on some of the data, uh, I think you can go either way. Certainly based on EBC main, Probably kissing balloon inflation should be routine in the provisional strategy, and I'd love to hear what Dr. Stankovic's uh, thoughts are on, there, on this. Uh, and I think operators need to be familiar with at least one bailout strategy when you're dealing with uh, attempting these cases and when you're doing provisional, you need to know at least a bailout strategy. And that's sort of just an algorithm which, is, which uh, I'm just going to skip. So thank you very much, and I'm happy to answer any questions.
Thanks, Fahim. Again, an excellent uh, opening and starting lecture to set the stage. Uh, Raj, uh, do you have a comment or question? Thanks, Jack. Fahim, great talk, as usual, very uh, insightful. Uh, can I, just a couple of points that you made, and can I sort of build a question on that? Uh, you, in your last slide, you said for a complex uh, bifurcation, left wing bifurcation, we must go to a two skin strategy, and I couldn't agree more with that. And you, but EBC Maine would obviously tell us otherwise. And you know, you also mentioned earlier that the worst thing is a poorly done two skin uh, strategy. But in, if you talk about EBC Maine, these are well done single skin strategies or well done two skins, and it is done by top operators across many centers. But there, if you look at the results, I'm sure, I'm, I know I'm jumping the gun a little bit, uh, of course, Tankovic will be talking later, but we we'll see that the TLF rates, uh, the primary endpoints around what, 15% and 18% uh, uh, in the two groups with the provisional approach. As compared to say the DK crash trial that you mentioned, where we got a TLF rate at one year of about 5%, I understand there are minor differences in the definition of the primary endpoint with MI, pretty procedural and MI, but still it is a stark difference. You know, yeah. Uh, yeah. if I have to go to a patient and explain to them that I'm going to uh, treat your left main bifurcation uh, with a provisional approach when they've got a complex left main bifurcation and say that your rates of complications at the end of one year could be around 15% or 18%, my surgeon would be trying to you know, push me out and say I can offer CABG at much better odds. What's your perspective on this? So I think it's hard to, you know, you, you, some of the comparisons apple and oranges. And again, you know, Dr. Stankovic is going to be talking about this, so I don't want to encroach on, on, on his, uh, uh, you know, his talk. But, you know, there were some differences. The DK crush was, was you know, showed outstanding results. DK crush was uh, used in a very small minority in uh, ABC Maine. So is it the DK crush that's the, the real issue or is it the expertise? It's hard to know because remember DK crush was also done by really superb experts and you know, not everyone is a Shaolin Chen either. So I think that uh, I, would, I would look at this in a sort of a objective fashion and say, yes, you know, two cent strategy has some, some advantages, but a provisional strategy is reasonable. To, you, know, you, you do expect reasonably good longer term results. And yes, it's slightly higher than the DK crush trials, but different patients, you know, different approaches. So um, I'm comfortable offering that, uh, you know, a provisional approach to a patient um, and, uh, you know, just seeing how they do. Um, and, and it's not, a, not, a, not the best answer, I agree. But uh, I think that, uh, you know, provisional approach is, has, has a fair number of merits in, in, in these, this kind of, these kind of cases. If I thanks, uh, thanks for him. Maybe I, 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 I take a pause here. I'll go and ask uh, uh, Goran followed by KK for their comments. Uh, Goran, do you want to try to defend the outcome numbers between EBC main and uh, DK crush definition two? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, first for the invitation. Second, data is data. I cannot compare apples and oranges uh, and it's completely two different uh, lesion and patient population, operator selection. So in my talk, I will try to explain that it's not comparison single versus two stand strategy. It's a provisional in the way that we try to promote it, to promote it as the stepwise layered increasing complexity, meaning that two stand strategy in the EBC main is not a failure and having two stand strategy is just a sequence in the case that you don't achieve uh, optimal result with single stand and final kissing. So uh, I, I, I'll put my perspective in my in my talk, but I, I enjoyed very much presentation and it has a lot of uh, philosophical uh, aspects, and I I really liked it very much. Thanks, Goran. KK, you are, you have asked. Oh yeah, no, I was just going to say that um, the other component of uh, which technology or rather which strategy to choose is also the patient's clinical status. So I recently did a case that normally I would try to do a two-stand technique, uh, but the patient was not exactly in the best state. There was a renal impairment and, you know, uh, EF was poor and I felt that, you know, um, a simpler technique was much preferred. And uh, right off the back, uh, folks would say, you know, don't you even think of roto, you know? So 
you know, so I think um, the clinical status uh, does count as well. And for sure to the Raj's point, I mean, um, uh, uh, in this particular scenario, um, the enemy of, of, of good is a beautiful. So I, I, I thought that the clinic, the patient's clinical status should also factor in the calculations. Just, yeah. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, I, I think we just take one question from the audience before we move to the live case. Uh, Dr. Tuyen is asking how to choose a balloon size. Is it MC semi-compliant for a side branch when you do final kissing balloon? Can I get a comment from Dr. Kotaro whether what is a recommendation for kissing balloon type balloons? Okay, hi, uh, I'm Dr. Okunai from Tokyo Bay Medical Center, Japan. Thank you for inviting me for the wonderful um, opportunity. I generally, I use a, a compliant balloon for the um, kissing. Uh, the main reason is uh, most, most cases that's easier to deliver. Um, that's a, basically the main uh, reason. In some occasions, uh, yeah, of course, I, I sometimes use a non-compliant button, but again, mostly uh, compliant button. I just want to hear other opinion if there. Thank you. Maybe, uh, uh, Goran, do you have an opinion? In the EBC main, was it mandated that is the kissing balloon was compliant, non-compliant balloons? No, it was recommended, of course, to be non-compliant just in order to control diameter by increasing the pressure, especially at the ostium of the side branch. If you use compliant balloons by increasing pressure, you increase the risk of dissecting the ostium. So it was our suggestion. You cannot say it's mandatory. Otherwise, it's uh, difficult to realize. But it was suggested, as we do in all consensus documents, to use short non-compliant balloons. And if you need to open the struts, of course, first you can open with small compliant and then you use for kissing non-compliant. But this is uh, just part of our practice and uh, we, we routinely do it in that way. Yeah, thank you very much. I think we are at uh, 2.30 and we're gonna go to the cath lab now. Uh, Cliff, can you on the cath lab in Dandok Singh now? Are you ready? Uh, yeah, thank you very much. And maybe they can be unmuted. Hi, uh, Hihua, we can, uh, I think you're coming in sharper right? now. Yeah, we can hear you now, Hihua. So uh, okay, uh, thanks a lot uh, for demonstrating a case. Uh, perhaps we'll go straight in for you to present the case for today. Okay, uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to introduce my team first. So next to me is uh, Jason Lowe, who is the co-primary operator for today. And we have uh, Sufang, as well as Kavita assisting. And we have uh, Rolando, our radiographer. And we have uh, Cliff, uh, uh, who is helping us in the background. Uh. So we have a lot of people supporting us for the live case. So we move on to the case uh, presentation. Yeah, please uh, carry on. Yeah, we have a 64-year-old uh, male with a past medical history of uh, high cholesterol, peripheral vascular disease, and a history of asthma. So he presented to our hospital with uh, unstable uh, symptoms in June. ECG shows uh, ST depression in the lateral leads. So he was brought to our cath lab for angiogram in late June. So these are the still images from the left coronary angiography. And you can appreciate that there is a distal left main uh, stenosis of about uh, 60%. And we did a, a physiological assessment using the IFR and it was abnormal. IFR was 0.78. We did the IFR uh, scalp pullback uh, with the co-registration. And you can see that there's a lot of pressure drop especially in the distal left main, signifying that this uh, segment is ischemic and will benefit from uh, revascularization. So we calculated the syntax score for the patient and it was uh, 24, which is, belongs to the intermediate risk group. He had a stenosis in the RCA and we offered CABG, but he was not keen. 
So I think uh, patients with left main, uh, multivessel disease, with uh, intermediate risk score, I think PCI is a reasonable option. So we proceeded to do a PCI first of the RCA, so standard with two large drug eluding stents, and uh, the plan is to do the stage of the left main to LAD today. So we have preserved uh, LV function of 55%. So I'll pass over to Jason to talk about our strategy. Hi, yes, so essentially what we are dealing with uh, <clears throat> is a Medina class 110. And essentially the discussion points today regarding the PCI for this patient uh, is whether should we go provisional um, versus two cent strategy and in terms of uh, uh, preparing the lesions and uh, how we're going to go about doing it. Um, so these are all certain step-by-step -step thing that all of us must consider before uh, undertaking left main PCI. So essentially um, what you can see here is the calcium score of, uh, of the left main LED. As you can see, large plaques you know, in the distal left main, and the austere LED as well is a very large calcified plug from the proximal to the mid uh, uh, LED as well. So we are dealing with very heavily calcified uh, distal left knee you know, as a proximal to mid uh, LED uh, plugs that we're dealing with. So um, we'll just we, carry on from there. Okay, we, we can show the uh, angiogram that we just did today. Uh, um, perhaps I'll also take a pause here. Thanks for presenting this wonderful case. I thought it was very appropriate for today. Uh, can I get a comment from Dr. Kumara? What would be your approach? Uh, I, I know you're not seeing all the information, but what do you think? Uh, is this a one or two stents? Do you need plug modification like what Jason was asking for? Would you have done FFR or would you have gone straight to some form of intravascular? Uh, yeah, sure, sure, the next one. Dr. Kumara, do you have a comment? Yeah. Sorry. Will you yeah. unmute uh, yourself? Thanks, Jack. So the, this is a, a, a scenario that we... Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead, please. Jack, you hear me? Yes, yes, go ahead. Okay, sorry. Yeah. This is we commonly see in our situation in our institution also uh, patients with very severe triple vessel disease who uh, in most cases, and uh, we would have done the same thing. We would have gone for the right, central the right, and then coming for the left system. And in a very condition like this, uh, I unfortunately, despite the, the, the fantastic data from the EC, I actually feel uh, I would go in for a two stand strategy from the word go. Uh, uh, and DK crash uh, preferred uh, strategy in uh, plug modification. If given the fact that there's so much of calcium, we may consider atherectomy with either rotablation or orbital atherectomy. And then uh, proceeding with the DK crush uh, uh, stenting, uh, stand the uh, circumflex and then uh, a main vessel stenting from the left main to the LED. Uh, but I think the, 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 it is also debatable, uh, given the fact that the circ is a bit small, the right is a dominant system, we may want to keep it simple if there are any concerns when it comes to the patient's demography. If the patient has got some high bleeding risk or you know there's some issues with compliance, they may want to keep it simple by then. Just Thanks, uh, Kumara. From I, the I think LED into the left main. Thank you. Thanks, Kumara. So I, I think we, you were breaking off here and there, but uh, what I'm hearing you is two stent, uh, potentially plug modification. The patient looks suitable for extended uh, DAPT. KK, would this be a case you go for plug modification upfront, or you would look at imaging? Yeah, I think uh, there is uh, really a, a ton of calcium there. Uh, the, I, I think it was the uh, Ario Cordo view, which had this, uh, you know, re inverted triangle of calcium that looked rather, you know, unpleasant. Um, and the CT scan uh, shows it well as well. Uh, I would uh, definitely uh, want to do some form of plug modification with a rotational atherectomy. 
um, the uh, wire bias will hopefully help to crack this. Uh, interestingly, I would I, or rather not interestingly, but I would also consider if despite say uh, you know uh, one seven five or two over if the if we don't have uh, if the balloon continues to have a residual waste, I would also consider a short wave. I think in this particular case, it is crucial to to do that because um, if not, you would potentially risk a suboptimal result uh, at the carina. Um, as to whether I would choose a two stent or one stent technique, uh, the ostium of the cirque appears to be not too badly diseased, uh, but there I might image uh, if I'm not sure. Uh, but um, I think there is an option for either technique here. And my reason for choosing a single stent technique, if possible, is because of the second bifurcation in the cirque system. And I, you know, I don't want to make my life too complicated. So I, I would, uh, you know, uh, my, my primary therapy strategy is to rotoblade, may need shockwave, if need be image, and then uh, hopefully pray for one stand technique. Thank you, over. Thanks, thanks, KK. Uh, one last comment from Dr. Obai. Uh, can you comment on the imaging? If you do imaging, is this a case for IVERS or OCT? Okay. Um... <clears throat> I think you can either um, go either way. Um, if the patient um, has normal kidney function, probably OCT is a preferred or imaging strategy to uh, evaluate the calcification. And also 3D wiring, which is a um, commonly uh, used technique for the bifurcation uh, stenting in Japan. Uh, I'm not crazy about the OCT, uh, by the way. Um, if the patient has some issues with the kidney function, probably IVAS uh, is a preferred imaging strategy. Um, yeah, I don't. Thanks. So. And, and you can you have a, a shockwave balloon there, right? Which is not uh, approved in Japan yet. Yeah, we do have the shockwave. Okay. Uh, ex Great. Expensive okay. device though for us, uh, right. but it's available. So uh, we'll go back to uh, Hihua. Hihua, would you like to tell us what is your actual strategy now that you're going to do for this patient and why? Okay, uh, so uh, we actually did the uh, intravascular ultrasound up front and we can show you the IVUS run. So this is the uh, volcano uh, IVUS uh, system and the IVUS went down quite easily. And we can show the uh, IVUS run, uh, Cliff. It's, uh, so this is a pullback from the mid. Uh, so you can see it's a- uh, Arc of calcium. Huh? Arc of calcium. Uh, despite this, there's quite a good uh, luminal diameter uh, between two to two five. Um, as the IVUS comes back, um, you can appre appreciate certain uh, angles that's actually a uh, calcified nodules actually protruding into the lumen itself, which is not surprising considering what we see from the calcium score. So we're fully back to the osteo LED. So uh, at the osteo LED now. You can see there's a big jump due to the large calcified nodule that's protruding in the distal left main osteoid. So, so at this juncture, I think uh, maybe we can have a discussion on what sort of orbital, sorry, uh, what kind of arterectomy device would you use? I mean, uh, if you go by the IVUS calcium score, I think the patient's score is at least two or above. Plus. So, so uh, happy to hear what the panelists and the experts have to s opinion. Maybe I get an opinion from uh, Fahim. So you have someone with relatively low clinical risk for extended debt. You can potentially go with more uh, complex standing strategy. You've seen the IVUS. Would, would this be someone you would do uh, attracting me for or would you try with a balloon first? I think with that extent of calcium, um, you've sort of seen it on that calcium score image that they had. Uh, and then by the IVUS, you're seeing nodular calcium. And then on some a few points, you're seeing almost a circular ring of calcium. So I would definitely use atherectomy. And I agree with KK that this may actually be a, a case where you need to combine it with shockwave 
Uh, shockwave doesn't work so well for nodular, but it certainly works very well for circumferential calcium. So in the first instance, I would definitely uh, aim for some sort of atherectomy. The choice now will be orbital versus uh, rotoblation. Any other comments from the faculty about, is there anything different you've done? Do you think that this uh, IVAS imaging necessary mandates attractomy? I, I might have, Jack, if I'm, I might have gone for a shockwave straight up instead of uh, doing rotablation or orbital uh, at all, um, especially at the OSCM uh, of, the, of the LAD, take a three or a 3.5 um, shockwave and do a therectomy. In the left main, the calcium's, uh, it's more like a calcium nodule, I know, and uh, it's probably four or five. I That's don't know if the shockwave will actually, you know, make a big difference, but I, I might just go for a shockwave up front, then do an OCT or IVAS and see how things look, instead of going for a population at all. Uh, okay. I would probably maybe di di diverge from that, Raj, only for the reason that, you know, as I said, you're seeing nodular calcium a lot of which is not going to respond to a shockwave balloon. This is assuming you can deliver it. Now, I do agree that if you can deliver a volcano ibis, you can probably de deliver just about everything. Yeah. But, uh, you know, you're seeing up in that film right now that there's, there's just nodules sticking out. Uh, I think that you really do need to ablate this uh, before I, you put a shockwave. The other thing is, as Jack said, it's expensive. So if you think you get, uh, my bias would be to, ablate and then do another imaging to see how much you've shaved off. And you, it may turn out that you've, uh, you know, you've gotten enough cracks just by uh, a threctomy that you don't even have to use shockwave. Although I suspect you may have to. So uh, Goran, maybe you can uh, have us comment here in the studies. Was there any mandate to use either imaging or a threctomy after that? Or yes, it was recommended. Uh, imaging was recommended, but we didn't have resources to make it mandatory. So it was not mandatory, but it was used in 35%, uh, the same as in DK Crash 5. We are not happy with that number. And if we go to this specific case, uh, since we use uh, relatively routinely only ROTA, we don't have orbital in Europe. I, I heard it's registered, but until recently it was not registered. And uh, as you said, and I fully agree with you, that shockwave is really with prohibitive price, especially looking at these nodules. Uh, I think uh, ROTA, uh, image guided uh, ROTA, then uh, cutting balloon or scoring will be perfect for uh, provisional. Uh, the, the ostium of the circ is free of disease. And in my uh, uh, mind, it's very difficult to put stent in uh, non-diseased vessel. Uh, just for uh, fear to maybe uh, have a plaque shift and uh, occlude. Uh, we know that uh, in true bifurcations, we can discuss complexity of disease and selection of two stand strategy, but in uh, bifurcation 110, I really don't see the place for stenting the circ first. Thanks, uh, Goran, for that last uh, comment. Uh, Hiwa, maybe you show us what you're going to do and what you have done so far. Okay, so uh, we've we taken the points by the uh, comments from the pan uh, experts. Uh, uh, and we actually decided to do an orbital arterectomy. Uh, I think uh, because the lumen of the vessel is quite big and we felt that if, to, if we to shave any calcium, we would need a very big burr, maybe 175 to 20. So we decided to go with an orbital uh, arterectomy. So we did about five runs. Uh, four at low speed and one at uh, high speed. And we were about to do the uh, IVAS pullback before we went, we went live. So this is the uh, uh, run showing you the orbital that uh, we did before we went uh, live. How did That's, it feel, uh, uh, Hihua, if I could ask, how was the feeling? I mean, did it, did it feel like it was grinding through? Uh, I think not much resistance, uh, yeah. Well, yeah, from the IVAS, you can appreciate actually because of the lumen, uh, some areas actually bigger than a 2.0 size. And I think the biggest bill we have in the lab is actually a 2.0. And uh, for us to achieve good ablation, uh, we may have to do it uh, uh, through the Japanese technique of a low speed uh, rotational burr. Um, 
So rather than subjecting the patient to that, I think uh, with this orbital system, uh, which is applicable to even bigger sizes, I think uh, it's, a, it's more a suitable attractomy device. So we're eagerly waiting to see your Ivers uh, post uh, OAS actually. Any comments from Nick uh, about OAS or attractomy? Hello, Jack. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have much experience with, uh, well, we don't have any experience with orbital atherectomy because it's not available in the Philippines. Give me same a shot. Same thing with intravascular ultrasound. So we're left oh, with uh, you want to show them the patient uh, yeah, 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 yeah. which is one case where I think I would go into what we call rotor regret if I don't rotor this, this case. Okay, so you are attractomized, uh, but since OS is not available, I, I thought OS is a decent choice. Uh, any comments? Uh, uh, who else has experience with OS who wants to comment? Dr. Kotaro, do you have a comment? I think uh, uh, I agree with the operator. Um, I think OAS is a reasonable choice. Um, we use a uh, rotor grader most of the cases, but this case, um, the, I think the location of the calcium is uh, opposite from uh, uh, guide wire. So I think that, you know, getting a guide wire bias may be a little bit difficult in this case. And also as the operator uh, mentioned, um, we need, you need a big bar uh, because this is a large vessel. Um, can, you know, chance of having the slow flow, um, maybe uh, increasing. So I think orbital is a good uh, choice. And uh, I've never used a shock button, but um, I agree that probably shock button may not be a best option for this kind of eccentric uh, calcium nodular type of the calcium. So, and uh, I think OAS is a very safe and a reasonable choice. And with without cutting balloon dilatation is a, probably the best way to go. Thank you. So we're gonna ask uh, Hihua to work uh, in peace for now. Uh, when he comes back to show us the IVERS, we're gonna ask Dr. Goran to uh, start the second lecture. So once it's done, we'll come back to you, Hiwa. Thanks a lot for that. I cannot share my screen because uh, you need first. Okay, thanks. Uh, here is, uh, can you see now my screen? Am I sharing? Yes, it? Uh, we can okay. see and hear you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. It was nice to uh, uh, listen to uh, first provisional lecture and then see the case, which is as a philosophy part of the provisional. And of course, as expected, uh, the focus of my, my lecture is uh, EBC main. And uh, when we discussed uh, the design of the next study in uh, left main comparing one versus two stand strategy in 2014, 2015, when we actually started planning it, uh, we had uh, uh, knowledge from many previous trials, which did not uh, show in non left main bifurcations any benefit associated with systematic two stand strategies. We started with Nordic BBC1, BBK, Cactus, and in each of those studies uh, we did not have the advantage, even uh, it was uh, uh, provisional, which uh, had reduced the rate of, of events in some of these studies. And uh, even in patients with large true bifurcations, like European Bifurcation Club 2 study, in which we compared provisional with culot we also did not see the benefit of culotte over provisional. And when we had uh, uh, longer term outcome uh, results from these initial studies from Nordic and BBC One, uh, there was a publication in European Heart that uh, there was five year difference in mortality if you put more metal instead of putting less metal in this kind of bifurcations. But uh, left main has specific uh, uh, anatomical and procedural characteristics, uh, which in our view uh, make it even more complicated to uh, have better outcome with the uh, planned two stand strategy compared to single stand. 
wider angle, uh, big, uh, big uh, circumflex, which is not really a branch. It's the area prone to calcification and there is a greater need for vessel preparation as we see in today's case as well. So our expectation was that in left main bifurcations, two strand techniques may be uh, even worse compared to non-left main bifurcations. And uh, th there is uh, ample evidence from non-randomized trials showing worse results for two strand strategies. However, randomized data in 2017 from Shaoli and Chen and DK Crash 5 support actually DK Crash in the left main, and this is the primary endpoint target lesion failure at one year. So definitely the rate of events was 10.7 in provisional versus 5% for uh, upfront DK crash, which was statistically significant. However, uh, uh, when, when you look this couple of mayor curves, uh, you, you simply need to ask yourself what happened here at 11.5 months and this sudden jump and increase in the rate of uh, actually what we see is a TLR because at 11 months, the curves were completely parallel. And when we stratify components of the primary endpoint uh, in the left side, you see uh, death and the mortality and the MI. And you see the two curves are completely parallel throughout the uh, period of 12 months. And actually what makes the difference is this 10.7 versus 5% rate of TLR actually. But I think it's important to, to say that angiographic follow-up was completed in uh, two thirds of the patients in both groups at the one year period, uh, 367, 370. Although it was mandated at 13 months, actually two thirds of the patients had angio follow-up before the primary endpoint was reached. So uh, we believe that angiographic follow-up uh, contributed to higher rate of TLR in uh, provisional. Uh, another important characteristic that uh, uh, is really unique for DK Crash 5 is that uh, mean lesion length QCA of the circumflex was 16 millimeters. And, uh, uh, practical question is what is the proportion of left main patients, left main PCI patients uh, with distal bifurcation disease in which osteal circumflex is longer than 16 millimeters. Uh, I, I really appreciate that in uh, Asian population, India, China, maybe also Indonesia, I, I don't uh, have uh, data on that. Uh, it's, uh, it's not rare, but in Europe, in United States, these kind of patients are really extremely rare. So having such a diffuse disease, we know from the Bennett and, and Stent trials since 1994, that in such a long diffuse disease, stent is better than balloon. So 44% uh, or 45% crossover rate in DK crash uh, five provisional arm to two stents for me is not high, it's actually very low because uh, if you have the disease of 20 millimeters in the CERC, we would definitely start by planning two stand strategy up front. And uh, I believe much higher proportion actually needs two stands in order to have comparable outcome with uh, DK crash. So EBC main, we, uh, we completed and we just presented this year as a late breaking trial at Euro PCR 2021 with the simultaneous publication in the European Heart Journal. And actually EBC main was designed to examine clinical outcomes with true left main bifurcation stem lesions, randomized to what we call stepwise layered provisional strategy versus systematic plan dual stem strategy. Primary endpoint was uh, uh, total mortality, target lesion vascularization and all myocardial infarction at one year and secondary endpoints, of course, were the components of the primary endpoint plus 10 thrombosis. In total, 467 patients were randomized in uh, 11 European countries in 31 centers. Uh, we decided to use uh, Resolutonic stand from the Medtronic. Uh, and uh, we have CRO CERC and Mary Claude Maurice uh, for conducting the study. Resolutonics was selected as a study device because of uh, 4.5 and 5.0 diameters, which could be really 
easily expanded to six millimeter if needed without deformation. A uh, very important aspect of EBC main is that we tried in the methodology from the very beginning to describe technical details for both approaches. So provisional is step-by-step -step layer technique according to EBC consensus documents from 2009 to 2015. In those documents, we recommend pot as a mandatory and kissing in the left main was also uh, mandatory according to protocol. And we also, uh, uh, when we speak about two stand strategies, we describe carefully the steps, but in general, it was operator preference, whether he will select DK crash, T tap or culot. It's important that step-by-step -step approach for each of these two stand strategies is also following EBC consensus documents, 2009, 2015. But in general, very important is that we recommend high pressure osteal bifurcation dilatation before kissing in both limbs of bifurcation. Kissing was mandatory plus minus final pot. So these are the uh, patient characteristics, 230 stepwise provisional, 237 systematic dual stand strategy. In general, predominantly male age, age of 70 and syntax score was around 23 in both arms, predominantly done by radial approach six French. Uh, when we speak about procedural summary, uh, duration of the procedure, fluoroscopy time, radiation exposure and contrast use all were in favor significantly of stepwise provisional compared to systematic dual span. And uh, it's, it's very important to say that we followed the uh, uh, protocol. POT was done in 85% of cases, kissing in 90% of provisional, and uh, stand to side branch as a part of provisional strategy after kissing. If the result was not uh, uh, optimal at the ostium of the circ, we proceeded uh, to uh, implanting second stand, not as a bailout, but as a, at as a plan, plan strategy to optimize the result in left main bifurcation. So 22% uh, uh, of patients, one out of five, really needed second stent in provisional arm. And uh, all those patients uh, had the final kissing and final pot was in uh, total in 81%. Uh, when we speak about two stand strategies, uh, the most popular in Europe as expected was culot. So 53% of or half of the cases were finished with culotte and another third with uh, T or TAP. There were in total 11 cases of DK crash or 5% and we did not have precise uh, description of the procedure. Let me go back. Uh, reasons for second stand were equally dissection of the CERC 10% and residual stenosis 12% in order to achieve optimal results second stand was done and uh, these are the primary endpoint results. So primary endpoint combined total mortality, all myocardial infarctions and TLR rates were 14.7% in provisional, 17.7% not, not significantly different in two stand strategy. If we go to secondary endpoints, there was no difference in mortality, 3% versus 4%. Uh, MI, 10% in both groups. Uh, I think we should uh, really look at this data for TLR, 6.1% in stepwise provisional, 9.3% in two stand strategy, uh, P0.16, uh, and stent thrombosis rate 1.7 versus 1.3%. So the conclusions of the EBC main are that stent treatment of true uh, bifurcation of left main stem coronary disease have generally good outcome with both approaches. Patients are treated equally well with stepwise layer provisional as with more complex dual stent approach. So the main uh, message in my interpretation is that stepwise strategy does not prejudge the issue of one versus two stents. We frequently try when we look at the NGO to say upfront, okay, I'll do two stents, I'll do a single stent. 
but according to EBC main, I, I think uh, we go uh, in a layer stepwise approach and if necessary, we put second stand. According to EBC main, second stand in true bifurcations is needed in approximately uh, one fifth of the patients, 20%. There were numerically fewer serious adverse events with stepwise provisional and only one fifth in provisional group required second stand. And uh, we believe according to this neutral study that stepwise provisional should remain the approach of choice for the majority of left main bifurcation interventions. But when we put in perspective two most important studies, CBC main and DK crash five, we see that number of patients were similar uh, DK Crash was published in 2017. We presented UBC Main 2021. Uh, DK Crash 5 was actually a study with uh, operators from 26 centers in Asia, and it was only Ima Shaban from Italy who participated. Uh, we had uh, 11 countries, 31 sites in Europe. Syntax score was significantly lower, but I said disease was much more complex, 7 millimeter. Uh, lesion length of the circumflex in EBC main versus 16 in uh, DK crash 5 and uh, uh, syntax was 31 versus 23 percent. Uh, two stands in EBC main as I said one out of five 22 percent in DK crash 5 half 45 percent. Plan two stand strategy was of course in one arm DK crash in the other it was predominantly cool T and tap uh, 90% of cases. Image use, IBUS use, uh, we are not happy, but it was 40%, 41%. So similar in both studies. And it's very important that there are differences in definition of primary endpoint. We had overall mortality, all myocardial infarctions and TLR, while DK crash was more stent oriented uh, outcome. So cardiac mortality, target target vessel MI and TLR. And as I mentioned already, 15 versus 18% rates of the primary endpoint in, provi in uh, EBC main, uh, 11 versus 5% in DK crash five. So in my interpretation, how should I treat left main bifurcation if I focus on stenting technique? Uh, we believe that stent treatment for true left main bifurcations can be uh, undertaken with low one year adverse events, employing either stepwise provisional or systematic dual stenting technique. Stepwise should remain the approach of choice for, for the majority of bifurcations, but among upfront two stent strategies for complex, according to definition two study lesions, there is a strong randomized evidence in favor of double kissing crash. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, uh, Goran. I, I really enjoyed your lecture and I flesh out a lot of the strong points in EBC main and DK Crush 5, even though you say you shouldn't be compared. Looks uh, like a DK Crush 3 trial to me, if you ask me. But uh, can I ask a comment uh, from Raj? Do you have a comment or question? Sure. Thank you, Jack. Uh, Prof. Tanker, it was great talk uh, as always. Thank you very much. I uh, have a question about this, um, the final kissing bullet inflation that is uh, mandated even after a single stent in the provisional approach in the EBC main study. So once you had on a crossover stenting, every patient has a final kissing bullet inflation. Now, I, uh, despite my arguments for DK crush, I always try and go for a provisional strategy unless there is significant long disease in the circumflex. But if I've gone for a provisional approach and if, I, if we do a kissing balloon inflation in a circumflex that has got significant disease, we are basically doing poor by the circumflex, aren't we? And would that not lead to poor and long-term results? Because with poor by you normally get about 30% risk genosis. I'm, yeah. Can you explain how we- Yeah, yeah, very, yeah, yeah. Uh, very nice question. Thank you very much for that one. Of course, I don't have exact answer, but what I, what I can tell you when we discussed kissing, the way we do kissing is probably different. We don't do POBA. We take very short non-compliant balloon, which is sized according to, differ, to uh, reference diameter of the circ, and we actually uh, protrude minimally in the ostium of the circ, the main role for kissing after distal recross with kissing, you should remove the jail struts from the ostium of the circ. 
that's one point. Second, we recommend low pressure or moderate pressure kissing with the main goal on one side with minimal proximal overlap in the polygon of confluence, we expand better stent in the distal left main. On the other side, by kissing balloon inflation, that's the only technique that will put carina in the center. And for the flow characteristics, it's very important on one side to remove jail struts from the cirque, on the other side to put carina uh, in the center. So this was the rational. Uh, we don't have data uh, to convincingly recommend routine in left main kissing. But if you analyze all the studies, there was never negative outcome of performing kissing in the left main. Results were usually neutral. So there is no uh, uh, benefit of systematic kissing, but there was also no penalty for performing it. And based on that, it was our suggestion. And this is what we try uh, to uh, justify. Uh, of course, such subtle differences uh, are based predominantly on uh, computational flow dynamic studies. We don't, don't have clinical data to support routine kissing, but in case of the small, small circumflex of less than 2.5, we just do final pot, we don't proceed with kissing. Criterion to enroll patient in EBC main was side branch bigger than 275. So the same as criterion for DK crush. And in such big vessels, we believe that discrepancy in diameter between LAD and left main justifies kissing balloon inflation again to open stent and to put carina in the center. Thanks, uh, Goran. Uh, I'll have a question from Dr. Obai yeah. followed by Dr. Kumara. Okay, um, thank you for the, uh, showing us great data. Is there any difference uh, in terms of uh, duration of uh, depth uh, between these two groups? Or, and uh, also there is any breathing complications difference? Or not? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, thanks. Another great question. It was not pre-specified. We didn't know data in 2015. But contemporary, we published the article on white paper, actually, of EBC for one versus two stand strategies, actually, for antithrombotic therapy in bifurcation PCI. The first author is Marco Zimarino, and there is a group of authors from all over the world uh, from the field. So based on the available evidence in the left main, uh, we believe that uh, there is no unique reason to to uh, prolong or to shorten duration based on specific location, left main versus non-left main. But according to uh, bleeding risk, according to patient clinical characteristics, according to single versus two stand strategy and image confirmation of the optimal result versus no image guidance, if you put all this in algorithm, you can individually uh, decide whether you are changing recommendations which we accept from the European Society of Cardiology. Great, great comment. Uh, Dr. Kumara? So Dr. Kumara, first uh, followed by the last comment from Fahim. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you, Professor. Excellent lecture. I just like to you know, get your comment on uh, using uh, the hybrid approach uh, when we we perform a decay, I mean a uh, 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 bifurcation uh, intervention. We, we do come across, especially in our setting in Asia, we see a lot of diffuse disease in the side branch, especially the circumflex. And we have got, I would, we have got no published data. But there are small studies to show that there is some advantage of using drug coated balloons for side branches. What's your opinion on that, Professor? Yeah, yeah. Just you need to publish those data. I like the approach myself as well, but please show me data, you know, because at every single meeting, especially in India, in Asia, everybody is talking about that. Please put together your data, publish some registry, and we will be happy if we design a ZBC study on comparison DEB versus uh, non DEB or uh, whatever is the strategy will be happy to open uh, for all, all the other centers interested in that one. Uh, 
Uh, we have EBC uh, meeting 8th and 9th of October this year. And uh, I'll be happy if you send me a request to help you connect and be part of the EBC, especially if you want to present some novel data or some recently published data. I'm working on the program with DVLUVAR mainly. So please send me a request for participation. I will be really happy to include as many of you uh, as you wish. Thanks. The Thank last, you, really last uh, question from Fahim before I move on. Uh, thank you, Goran. That was an excellent talk. Uh, I, I just want to pick your you. brains on something that you may have already alluded to, but uh, just, just for everyone's clarity. Um, you know, the sense I get from EBC Maine is that the disease was relatively, you know, the cases were relatively less uh, complex. I mean, and I base that on the fact that, you know, majority of the side branches were prepped. In fact, majority of the lesions were prepped with just ballooning. Uh, you know, rather than um, other devices that track me, et cetera. The mean stent length in the main vessel was about 22 millimeters, if I remember correctly. I can't remember the last time I used just a 22 millimeter stent in the left main LED. It's usually much longer for us. Uh, you know, the mean side branch length in the circumflex was just seven millimeters, uh, you know, frequently in, I would say in the last 20 DK crush cases I've done, we had to put in, you know, at least uh, 20 odd millimeters in the circumflex. So I'm wondering that, is this just a function of complexity? And that would make sense that when lesions are less complex, provisional works fairly equal to a two stent strategy, while when lesions are quite complex, you really have to go to two stent. Uh, what are yeah. your thoughts on that? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for this detailed explanation, actually, of the whole difference between two studies. Uh, when you say only seven, if you look the data, QCA data from all contemporary left main studies, seven millimeter circumflex is not just set seven. It's uh, pretty long, but it's really only seven compared to 16 in the DK crash five or 20 in definition two. And we absolutely agree 100%. If you have to use 20 millimeter long uh, disease in the circ, this is two stand strategy up front. If you are skilled, experienced operator in DK crash, this is excellent indication for DK crash. We completely obey and accept DK crash five for that kind of lesion and patient complexity. Uh, in Europe, we will probably do inverted QOT or T or TAP, but I don't think it makes difference. It's planning based on lesion complexity. And DK crash five, you don't, please don't forget, was done by the group of operators who do 300 PCI per year for the last five years with 20 left mains in those period of the five years. And uh, you, you need to provide to steering committee five cases of successful DK crash in order to be considered, to be considered for inclusion in the study. If you apply those criteria to UK, out of 800 interventional cardiologists in UK, six of them fulfill criteria to be operators in DK crash five. I think this is self-explainable. I don't need to justify any longer how experienced you need uh, to be uh, in order to achieve such wonderful uh, results with DK crash. That was an excellent uh, Q&A session, uh, but we want to go back to the CAF lab though. So Goran, don't leave us because uh, no, I'm no, sure no, there's I'm more not. questions for you. Yeah. No, no, so, I'm not uh, leaving. I'm Cliff, just thanking you. Cliff, uh, let's go back to the CAF lab. I think uh, CAF lab has moved on quite a lot. So we'd like to see what Hee Hua has done. Uh, uh, then can we get uh, Hee Hua unmuted as well? I think you can hear us. Yeah, we can hear you. So please show us what you have done so far. We are dying to see it. So after we did the uh, orbital arteriectomy, uh, there was some trouble uh, advancing the IVUS. So we put in a body wire, Sion uh, ES, and uh, that gave us uh, extra support to uh, uh, advance the IVUS catheter down. And we, will, uh, we decided to do pre-dilatation with uh, two NC balloons, 27515 in the prox to mid and the left main to osteo LED, we did a 3515. Uh, 
So uh, there was no significant waste in the balloons. And you can see that we have quite a good uh, lumen gain. And uh, we're going to show you the IVIS uh, right after we did the post dilatation with the two NC balloons. So, so Cliff, you can show at the IVIS now. Yeah, we're seeing the IVIS on the screen. So this is post OAS pre dilatation or post uh, balloon dilatation? So it's post OAS and post uh, balloon, uh, two balloons uh, dilatation with NC balloons. What size was the NC balloon? And is it a the cutting balloon was... or just. No, the first one was 275.15 and the second one was 35.15. Okay, so adequately sized NC balloons. Can, can you tell yes. us what you're seeing? I think uh, the, the, the calcification in the mid is maybe just one or two arcs. Uh, and we felt that a lot of heavy calcification is in the proximal to extending to the distal left main. And you can see that there may be a crack in the uh, calcified plug, but we're still, we felt that the calcium burden is still uh, quite high and we felt that it's better for us to use the short wave, especially for the distal left main and the prox LED uh, before we proceed to stenting. So I'm happy so to I hear- always have, uh, thing, people, uh, uh, I always have some issues about judging whether to use more devices after uh, some form of attractomy and balloon dilatation. So you have uh, quite a, at least 180 degree calcium arc. It looks fairly thick although you can't really measure it on IVIS. And post-balloon dilatation, it looks decent, but why did, and your balloon expanded. So why did you say you wanted to use short wave on top of that? Uh, we felt that there was uh, this like 270 arc of calcium and uh, we just worried you don't want to have a regret when you put in the stand, you know, and then you, you don't want to do short wave after you stand. So you rather short wave, uh, get a, a, a convincing calcific fracture and then before you implant the stent. So this was uh, made, yeah, and, and, sorry. Yeah, and, and there was also some calcified nodules. So I felt that, you know, uh, best to do whatever you can before you implant the stent. Sorry okay. to interrupt. There's still concentric calcium in that prox LED distal left main. So I think it's fairly reasonable to shock it uh, and maximize your, uh, your calcium modification. Hey, Hima, awesome. you mentioned that you use a 275 balloon and the other balloon was what size again? Uh, 3515. 3515 and 3515 had no waste. Uh, no, very little waste. Sir. Okay. Well, the reason I ask is because I presume the largest shot wave we have is 35, yeah? I think oh, we have a 40. 40, four. Four is it? Four. Okay, okay, good. So is that the balloon you're going to choose? Can you show us Sorry. a geographic view uh, on one view, please? Uh, Cliff, can you switch to angiogram? Yeah, of the 3.5. That would be, you know, uh, interesting to see um, whether there was or not a waste. But I, I generally like the idea of a short wave in this case because it's just so much calcium. But it would be nice if we could see it on, you know, with a 3.5 balloon, how it looked like. <clears throat> can you show us you can the, show the epicaudal when we did the uh, post uh, uh Back on, yeah. So th this is uh, the stand of the balloon. This is a 3-5 balloon. This is a balloon. This is a balloon, yeah. So any comments from everyone? It looks very well expanded, if you ask me, though. On the NC uh, balloon. I will see another view. Is there another view? The inferior surface might have a little dent in it, you know. Go back one view. Go back one view. You do want to look at it in orthogonal views. Yeah, yeah, there. Yeah, there is. We have an AP cranial, and then we have a AP cranial view. You yeah, you definitely have a waste there. There's a dent. Yeah. Now, of course, a lot of the time, this is nodular calcium, and so the shock may, may, may not hit it. What they say tell us is that uh, you have to deliver most of the pulses where that nodule is to uh, crack it. And even then, sometimes you don't. But given the complexity of this case, I think it's reasonable to shock it and get the maximal modification. So uh, this looks like this still left main also already uh, calcification, perhaps nodular area. Can you show yeah. us a short wave sequence there, uh, Hifa? No, we, we haven't, uh, we're waiting to go live. <laughs> so oh, we, we go, okay, we're going to do okay. the short wave So I, I wanted you to do it because we don't have much time. I really want you to finish up the case. Sure. Actually, you don't have to wait for us. <laughs> so uh, you're going to deliver a short wave now? Yes. Okay, so uh, watch you do the shock wave. Is it a 4-0 shock wave? 
No, we use a three five. Uh... Okay. Uh, can I ask Fahim or the other panelists, when you do a shock wave uh, in the left main, do you take any special precautions as you're occluding the vessel for about 10 seconds at a time? Actually, no. Surprisingly, they tolerate it very well. I mean, you just keep an eye on the blood pressure and you can oh, always, nice. you know, yeah. truncate your shocks and just, you know, give five pulses and then bring the balloon That's down. Funny. But frankly, I've never had to do that. Um, okay. And I've done a couple of cases work very well, like I said. I didn't yeah, they tolerate it very well. Surprising. I tend to go, you know, larger, you know, in the, in the left main as big as you can get, which is 4 -0. Uh, yeah, you can't necessarily go wrong with either way. But the most common issue is delivering the device, actually. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So you Not have some trouble uh, advancing the short way. If I'm trying to deep sit my guide, right? You can see it's backing off. Uh. So what are the tips and tricks here, uh, Fahim? You have some tips and tricks here for. Uh, yeah, so when, when, I, when, I, when that happens, which is not uncommon, I like to either buddy wire, which he was done already, or you can change to a much more supportive wire. I like the wiggle wire a lot. That's something, that's my go-to wire. Uh, just, yeah, I like the wiggle too. Just swap it, but the, the wiggle is really difficult to manipulate. So very often I'll just put a micro catheter and quickly swap it out. You know, wire is the uh, other wire we use commonly for IBL in a hospital is a scion blood. Start it, start it very safe and uh, gives excellent support for the IVR. Yeah. Well, you can see so you're across, uh, is that here? Yeah, expertly. Yeah, I've used uh, three wires actually. <laughs> okay, let's go up. Four. Okay. okay we are pulsing now. Okay. There is definitely a distal waste. Huh? It's just uh, tapering, um, you know, uh, residual narrowing. Okay. okay. Uh, nice. Hihua or Fahim, can you let us know where the shock device is most effective? Which segment of the balloon? Where should you place it? In the middle, towards the end, proximal or distal marker? Okay, sorry, are we just uh, focusing now? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, no, no problem. Uh, Fahim, any tips and tricks for where to place a shockwave balloon? Or you just pulse it repeatedly? The same position or different? You mean you place it where the lesion is, you know, your, your emitters are not exactly in the center of the balloon, so you have to be a little off center. Uh, but you know, use, okay, use the angiogram to place okay. it um, and, uh, and just go up basically. And, uh, you know, you, you, I think it's important to observe the balloon. It looks like some of it expanded. Uh, it looks at least approximately pretty well expanded. Um, yes, okay, we, we, we switch to AP Cordo. I, I think usually we, we put the balloon where the, you think where the most calcium is. And I think we need to examine the, how the balloon expands from two different projections, I think. Like a bit. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. I think for fellows, it's important to understand that there is, uh, you have 80 pulses in total. So it's kind of, you have to use it like currency and uh, manage the pulses. So once you achieve expansion, then move on to the next area uh -huh. or decide a priority that you're going to give all the pulses on a, on one oh. specific troublesome spot, which is yeah. often a nodule. Uh, and even, and then you may get the best possible expansion, although it hey. may not be complete. Hey, he, I was thinking that in this view, uh, in this particular location on the left main, uh, your your cranial view would might show that, uh, you know, that uh, dense or waste uh, a bit. Okay, so we, we can switch back to epicranial. Can I ask a question? Yes, please, uh, Doctor. Yeah, do Ivana. do these uh, body wires? You you now in this case you using three guide wires. Do these do it's, extra it's, wires extra care or helps cracking the uh, calcium or Basically, no, nothing, doing nothing. Oh, I'm, I'm not aware that you affect the shockwave uh, therapy, actually. The... I don't know about it, Warrior. Yeah, it should uh, uh, Anyone has any borders since have opened up? Yeah. yeah. So, it looks, better, yeah. looks better, I think. Yeah, yeah. it looks better, yeah. yeah. For sure. I think so, yeah. Should we give all? Yeah, yeah, we finish all the passes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I so think the answer to the wires is the wires should not make a difference because the acoustic wave will not be interfered by having 
an extra wire. As long as you're in t- uh, in contact with the vessel wall, you should be mm-hmm. okay. All right, thanks. So Raj, you see that patient is actually very stable throughout all the pulsation and the occlusion. There's some ventricular capture. Uh, you can see there's a good lumen gain. Uh. You finish it. Uh. Okay. okay. I've done uh, two uh, IVLs and left mines. One of them was on ECMO, so it made no difference. Bus, 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 bus. Exactly like so the balloon burst, I see yeah, the balloon burst. This is not uncommon too, that it bursts. Yeah, but now. okay. Artery is okay. I don't Can we go back to 15? Hiwa, do you want to show the audience another IVUS run? Yes, yes. Before we stand. Yeah. So, uh, Hiwa, I, I, that was very nice, actually. I think you, you showed a lot of stuff. Um, I, I, I'm thinking that I'm going to go in for the third lecture first by Nick. Sure. Uh, uh, sure, sure. Uh, then we'll come back to you. Uh, do you think you can finish up? Then you can show us what you've done at the end. Yeah, I think we at least we'll stand. Uh. <laughs> yes, uh, please. Yeah. So, uh, Nick, uh, maybe I'll go back to you again to deliver the last lecture, which is very complimentary. Okay. I'll share my screen now, Jack. Give some GTN. Give some GTN. Yeah. Okay. Wow, luckily, the thing went down with three wires. Uh. <laughs> no joke. <laughs> so, uh, I, I just have to mute the, the cath lab. Uh, the interesting conversation. But, uh, Nick, uh, maybe you can yep. start. I'm sharing my screen now. Okay, so sorry about that. So Kenneth uh, is typing in uh, quite a few great comments uh, in the chat. Kenneth Chin from Malaysia. Uh, He looks like a proponent of uh, OCT. And uh, in the OCT criteria, just to refresh it, Calcium thickness of more than 0.5 mm with an arc of more than 180 degrees um, would be a good criteria to say that it needs some form of attractomy and the balloon may not crack it. Um, Nick? Are okay, you Jack. Uh, you can hear me and you can see my slide, right? Uh, sorry, I, I'm not seeing any slides. Uh, am I okay, the only right. one? We can't yeah. either. Okay, hold on, hold on, give me a second. So uh, Kenneth is actually asking Hihua whether he can use OCT to look at it. But I think uh, Hihua is probably going to finish up with just Ivers. How about yeah, now? now can, yeah, now we can see your slides, uh, maybe a slideshow mode. Okay. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. And I'm happy to be here with uh, all the distinguished panelists uh, to this afternoon. Uh, I was assigned to talk on a pharmacotherapeutic uh, regimen for left main standing. Okay, and uh, these are my disclosures. I have none, no financial conflict related to this. And this will be my presentation outline. Okay, uh, discuss very briefly why left main PCI is uh, unique and the pathologic stand failure mechanisms. Uh, how long should we put these patients on dual antiplatelet therapy, identify high bleeding risk patients, and discuss the proposed EBC anti-thrombotic algorithm, which uh, Professor Skankovic was uh, talking about earlier, and then present you with a few sample cases. So left main is is the unique in itself, and left main PCI is uh, equally unique, and we've we've heard Dr. Goran uh, discuss this earlier, but some of the issues that may be related to PCI of the left main will be the greater elastic tissue content of the ostium, particularly which is funnel shaped and uh, directly comes from the aorta. Uh, there is accelerated atherosclerosis in the intima, particularly in the lateral walls because of the, uh, this is the area with the low shear stress area. The carina is frequently free of disease because this is the area which is the flow divider. Uh, being a high shear stress area. I was tells us also that the plug burden in the left main bifurcation is more frequently diffuse rather than focal. And that uh, the plug or the atheroma actually extends into the proximal LAD in about 90% of cases, which sometimes we don't realize. Pathological mechanisms of left main stand failure. There was a group that studied these uh, autopsy findings in patients with uh, 
who died, not necessarily because of left main failure, but rather because uh, they had left main stenting prior. And they found out that about majority of these cases were due to stent thrombosis, with a few with uh, chronic total occlusion being ex bypass uh, coronary bypass patients, and uh, only few ISR cases. But again, remember that these were dead patients, and probably we see more ISR in living patients. Okay. Uh, Malaposition was the strongest predictor of uh, pathologic stent failure in, in these uh, uh, autopsy studies. And the uncovered stent struts crossing into an osteal side branch compose about 30% of the pathological stent failures. Now, why does this happen? Um, bifurcation and left main. Left main is your most unique bifurcation, as, as we all know. And the overall incidence of stent thrombosis in bifurcation lesions is actually about two times compared to non-bifurcation lesions. So we heard Dr. Stankovic talk about, uh, talk about the advantage of doing single stent versus or provisional stenting versus planned two stent strategy right away. And this may be one of the reasons why uh, we see better results because two stents are always or almost always associated with a higher incidence of stent thrombosis and uh, target lesion failure. There's actually an increased incidence of strut malaposition and stent under expansion due to the nature of the bifurcation and its uh, fractal geometry. And uh, the turbulent flow is localized and which, which increases the propensity for uh, thrombosis in these areas. And as mentioned earlier, sometimes when we do left main PCI, we end up usually with a greater number of stents or sometimes a longer number of stents, which may actually still augment the thrombotic risk. So what drugs or what antithrombotics do we use on top of the standard aspirin? And for primary PCI, the Cagular and Prasuglar have both been shown to be beneficial when used in patients with ACS and that uh, both Ticagrelo and Prasugla were associated with lower recurrent MI after primary PCI compared with clopidogrel. Um, and there's a tendency, although there's not enough evidence to back this up, that in patients that we think are high risk for, uh, for thrombosis or ischemia, we tend to use a Ticagrelo over Prasugrel, and this is actually recommended, but based on expert opinion only. Now, in a recent trial, uh, the ISORE Act 5, Prasugrel was actually preferred over uh, Ticagrelor because it was associated with a lower adjusted 30-day mortality compared to both Ticagrelor and Prasugrel. But always remember that still Prasugrel and Ticagrelor are still preferred over Copidogrel. Okay, um, sometimes you may need to, to give your antiplatelet activity right away and in situations where you think your antiplatelet may be delayed because of administration of morphine or vomiting or poor uh, gastric motility, or in cases where you are not sure whether these patients were given uh, dual antiplatelet loading in the emergency room, you may consider uh, giving um, Tangler, which is an IV uh, antiplatelet and fast acting, but short. Again, this is not available everywhere else in the world. Okay, let's just briefly review the focused update on dual antiplatelet therapy. And um, dual antiplatelet in general is recommended for 12 months in ACS patients. It may be reduced to six months in patients who are at high risk, but still comes in as ACS. And if the patient can tolerate, it, can tolerate the dual antiplatelet without bleeding complications, you can actually, or it's a 2B recommendation to extend this beyond 12 months. And the uh, ticagrelor, can be given based on the Pegasus trial for more than 12 months at 60 milligrams uh, twice a day in patients who are at high ischemic risks. For, for uh, chronic coronary syndrome or stable coronary syndrome, six months is the recommended um, dual antiplatelet therapy uh, administration with a 1A recommendation. You may lower it down to three months if you think your patient is at high risk based on the precise DAP study for uh, bleeding. You can actually increase it to six months in patients who have high thrombotic risk, but at low bleeding, and in patients with stable CAD in whom three month APT uh, poses safety concern, you may actually consider reducing it to one month, but with 
the risk of a higher thrombosis rate. What is the optimal duration for the APT for left main in particular? And there's no standard recommendation yet for left main nor for bifurcation. But there's this Korean study that says that in most patients, as long as they can continue dual antiplatelet without major bleeding events, prolonged dual antiplatelet therapy for 12 months after left main stenting showed better long-term efficacy compared to less than 12 months with comparable safety. Now there's another Korean study again that says, no, that may not be the case in all left main case, left main PCIs. The number of stents may have something to do with it and that a single stent strategy may actually not make much difference in terms of prolonging uh, dual antiplatelet, but it may have a big difference or a significant difference if you are dealing with a two stent strategy, meaning two stent um, left main PCI may be at higher risk for thrombosis, therefore may benefit from dual antiplatelet that's more than 12 months. Okay, the precise DAPT score, uh, the, the size, precise DAPT study rather, uh, showed that the prolonging uh, dual antiplatelet therapy for more than 12 months may actually benefit only those who are at low risk for bleeding, but may not show any benefit in patients who are at high risk for bleeding, whether uh, this is uh, related to the complexity of the procedure or related to the patient's complexity. So again, uh, long DAPT is better only for patients who are at low bleeding risk and there is no benefit in giving uh, dual antiplatelet, prolonged dual antiplatelet therapy in patients who are at high bleeding risk. What are the factors affecting antithrombotic therapy in these patients? This was a, a study by Charam, Dr. Charam, Charalampos. And he says that prolonged DAPT is associated with reduced incidence of all cause death. Yes, that's true. But extension of DAPT may be beneficial only in patients that have implantation of two cents compared to one stent, and that uh, these patients may be at higher risk uh, if, if, uh, for bleeding if you extend it beyond 12 months. Uh, there is a practice here among some of our friends in, in the region, particularly in Korea, I think, that uh, they add philosophical to uh, the triple antiplatelet therapy, but there's no uh, clear benefit of adding philosophical on top of the dual antiplatelets. Okay, this is uh, one stratification of uh, patients who may benefit from uh, 12 to 24 months of uh, antiplatelet therapy or dual antiplatelet versus patients who may actually benefit for uh, lo shorter duration of three to six months of dual antiplatelet therapy. So what, again, again, the question is, what is the optimal DAPT duration after PCI? We don't know because almost always the problem is if you try to prevent thrombosis and in patients with high bleeding risk, your risk for major bleeding becomes higher at the expense your risk for major bleeding actually becomes higher and the benefit that you get preventing thrombosis is actually nullified. So how about switching between oral P2Y12 inhibitors? This is supposed to be a lecture for cardiology fellows, so we may have to go back to basics again. So can we switch? Yes, we can switch from topidogrel to ticagrelor or ticagrelor to topidogrel, depending on the patient's uh, risk for bleeding or absence of risk for bleeding. So you may escalate if indicated in the early phase after a complex PCI, meaning from topidogrel to a more potent uh, P2Y12 uh, um, inhibitor, or you may deescalate from either prosugular or prosugral or ticagular back to topidogrel if there is increased risk for bleeding. But again, there should be caution with regards to premature discontinuation as it is associated with significant risk for stent thrombosis. So these are, this is the switching strategy that the ESC 2017 has recommended. If you are switching or de-escalating back to clopidogrel or down to clopidogrel, you need to preload the patient again. You don't need to preload if you are going up to, to ticagular or prasugrel. Okay, what else is new? Is aspirin the bad guy? This, this study from uh, uh, Dr. O'Donoghue seems to suggest that if you remove aspirin, your risk for bleeding becomes lower. So 
uh, this, sorry, the study says that if you discontinue aspirin, but you continue the P2Y12, you reduce the risk of bleeding when stopped at one to three months after PCI, but this is not yet part of the guidelines. The coagular monotherapy in the global leaders trial, one month of uh, dual antiplatelet followed by the coagular monotherapy was associated with a similar risk of two year all cause death, although there was uh, no significant reduction in the bleeding risk when compared with 12 month dual antiplatelet therapy with aspirin. How about the twilight trial? The twilight trial says that patients undergoing complex PCI who had completed three months of ticagrelor plus aspirin can be shifted to ticagrelor alone monotherapy. And this was associated with lower incidence of bleeding without increasing risk for ischemic events and um, compared to ticagrelor plus aspirin. Again, not part of the guidance, but things that we may have, we may consider. Now we all know that uh, a lot of our patients who are at high ischemic risk are also at high bleeding risk. And the AERC, the um, uh, Academic uh, Research Consortium, has come up with a simpler way of scoring these patients uh, with uh, one major or two minor uh, factors that may make the patient high risk or, or classified as high risk for, for bleeding. Um, the app, this app is very, very practical. Uh, it's, it's easy to use and I hope you can download it. And I think all patients before undergoing PCI should be scored according to this app. This app not only gives you the high bleeding risk status, but it can also give you the bleeding versus thrombosis trade-off. And this will make you, help you decide uh, how to approach your patients. Um, if you missed the lecture last June 24, this was a very uh, educational, very practical lecture on uh, high bleeding risk patients, particularly the one that was delivered by Dr. Jafari. So please try to review this uh, from YouTube or Wonder Medical. Now, this 10 type may also affect uh, dual antiplatelet duration. And there's one significant trial, the Onyx One Global Study, and particularly Onyx One Clear Study that says that it may be safe to use just uh, one month of dual antiplatelet therapy, depending on the type of stent that you use. Again, in the 15th uh, EBC consensus um, meeting, they were not able to come up with, uh, with a clear recommendation for antiplatelet therapy for left main PCIs. And um, this, this is the blank that is left here. But again, there is a group of physicians um, headed by Dr. Marco Zimarino, sure. who was able to come up with an ABC white paper on antithrombotic therapy after LCF, after, after um, PCI. Um, again, this is because of the issues that are related to the optimal antithrombotic therapy after bifurcation PCI. And uh, I would like to thank Dr. Zimarino for lending me some of the slides here that I can present to you. Okay, so these were the studies assessing the impact of dual antiplatelet duration after PCI. And most of this, if you would notice, and sorry for this, but this is a really busy slide, but this, an important slide. It says here that the risk for bleeding actually um, trumps the, the benefit that you get from antithrombotics. So it's very important to be able to identify which patients would benefit from what. Okay, so what the EBC tried to do is to come up with a tailored approach based on clinical presentation, stenting strategy, the use of imaging to optimize PCI and the, bleeding, the baseline bleeding risk of the patient. So this is the proposed algorithm for the APT duration. So this is based now on the clinical presentation, whether the patient was stable or admitted or, or admitted due to acute coronary syndrome. It also depends on the PCI strategy, if it's a one stand strategy, two stand strategy, or a bailout strategy. Now you need to assess the bleeding risk of the patient and also the algorithm is based also on whether the PCI was guided with uh, imaging. So a high bleeding risk patient, but with use of imaging when, when the PCI was done, would require or would, would be advised to follow this, uh, this algorithm. 
high bleeding risk, but no use of PCI, then you may need to do to give a longer duration of the APT uh, in both groups of stable and, and, and uh, acute coronary syndrome. For low bleeding risk patients who had uh, optimized PCI using imaging, these are the patients who may actually be, be safe to be put on the shortest possible dual antiplatelet therapy. And for those with low bleeding risk but did not have um, IVUS guidance during PCI, you may actually um, increase uh, the dual antiplatelet therapy in the, in the highly thrombotic risk patients, the ACS patients, to beyond 12 months. So this is more or, more or less a tailor fit um, strategy on how to um, give your dual antiplatelet therapy. I have a thanks, few uh, cases now. Uh, oh, yes. The, thanks, Dr. Uh, uh, Nick. Uh, I think yeah. we have run out of time. time. So okay, sorry, okay. but thanks for showing us such a great uh, spread of uh, data. But we mm -hmm. want to give uh, Hihua some time back in the cath lab. Yeah, sure, so sure. I'm going to ask you to see whether you can uh, stop share. Yes. And um, Cliff, uh, do you mind if we go back to the cath lab? Um, we'll come back to you, Nick. Yeah, you sure. For the Q&A. Yeah. Um, so Hihua, are you unmuted? See whether we can see where you're at. We have yep. uh, uh, 10 minutes left. Uh, uh, okay. So uh, after we shockwave and did the IVUS, uh, we were planning to stand, but I think we had some trouble uh, delivering the Onyx uh, 3538. So I'm uh, not sure whether because of the shockwave, there may be some disruption of the Pacific plug, and then you know some of it may be protruding into the lumen. That's why we couldn't deliver the stand. So we went back with a new NC balloon uh, to uh, open up the channel, and then we were able to deliver the 3538 stand. And we, we did a port first with a 4015. And we were just trying to post dilate the distal segment of the stand uh, followed by the final IVUS. Uh. And the, there was no compromise of flow to the circumflex and the OM. It's uh, actually looking quite good, actually. So this is a pause moment now. Hiva, I'll ask you, is your practice after the pot uh, or before the pot, a routine kissing balloon, or you're happy with just a pot and leave it as that? Uh, I'm, I'm happy to leave it as that, to be honest, uh, because I think the emphasis, the focus for, for this patient would be the left main LED. Uh, the second fact, of course, is uh, not a very big artery, but the flow is preserved. So I think we'll try to get an optimal stand result for him for the left main LED. Do you have time to show us the IVUS uh, post uh, 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 short wave? Yeah, sure. as well? We can do an IVUS run for you. No, maybe Cliff, you show the IVUS run after the short wave. I, I need to post it first. Uh, the, yeah. yeah, post it first. Uh, yeah. And please, uh, the faculty, anyone uh, with any comments, uh, please go. So, 3538, you say, is that correct? Yep. Yes, it's an uh, Onyx. Uh, so, 3538 uh, can expand to 5.0. On yeah, the stand has an excellent uh, expansion profile, and um, you know, I think um, you, you know, after the post dilatation, it'll be good to see how it looks like. Um, and yeah, the iris uh, is epicurean, epicurean. Yeah. Okay, so Hihua, you're this. you're doing a iris now, Hihua. No, no, I'm just finishing the post dilatation of the distal uh, segment of the stand because we, 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 we did a port first of the left main and the proximal LED. 14. So here what? The left main, you went up with a 4 or 4-5? Uh, 4 4 okay. Yeah, but we, we, we can examine with IVUS and then uh, if it is suboptimal, we will go back with a 4-5. Uh. I think you have a very, pretty good expansion, it looks like it. So we, we'll do a quick IVUS uh, before the session ends. What, what okay. pressure are you going up to, Jason? 20. And I think for trainees, it's important to understand that, you know, post dilatation is not going up at 16, you know, it's 20, 22, 24 atmospheres, those, those kind of numbers. And as long as you know what the vessel size is, you will not perforate if you choose the 
appropriate sized uh, non compliant balloon i think we can ivis now yeah we we just show you the ivis so i think if we run out of time then uh, we'll just uh, do the post adaptation off camera <laughs> so uh, can i just check back go around about raj earlier question uh, in the ebc main kissing was routine uh, but i, I see routine. the results here looks wonderful actually so would you say that this is a very ebc like patient Medtronic stands, you know, a provisional port, uh, well attractive Is kissing beneficial or necessary here? Uh, Goran, are you still with us? I think uh, Goran may have dropped off. And uh, Raj, I go back to you then, since you are the one who asked the question. Uh, would you have a uh, kiss here? No, certainly not. Uh, because it's an excellent result. I mean, for me, the left main LED scan is really crucial. So anything that you do to disturb the scan is not worth it. I mean, if you look at the data from the Corbis registry. Uh, Chris, can we have the Ivers and Angel together? Wow, you, very crazy. Uh, if you do a kissing balloon, you might get some benefit in the side brand from side brand. Very that the integrity of the... In the main vessel, the left main of the LED. I, so I think... Allow I would port and I would stop there. I wouldn't guess. Any of the other panel will have a different opinion for this case? Fahim, you'll yeah, go with a DB on the side branch? No, my, my practice would be to, if it looks okay, just leave it. That's been my practice always for provisional. Now, you know, with EBC main, you know, their approach was to, to do a kissing every time. And there are some pros and cons to it. The pro is that you have access now to the circumflex you uh, change the carina shift back to a more normal shaped circumflex. Um, and then, you know, for future access, if you need to do something, you already have the doors open. Uh, but uh, I, for me, you know, I will still, if the circumflex looks reasonably okay and it's not quote unquote pinched, I'm quite happy to leave it alone and not uh, disrupt the stent as Raj said. And just, uh, you know, uh, if somebody has to go back in again later on, they can certainly put a small balloon and open up the strut. Yeah, I kind of agree with that. Uh, if the vessel looks good, um, I would prefer to leave it. I, I, I think the EBC main uh, does inform us a little bit. So if it doesn't look good, I tend to go, especially if the patient is stable. Uh, you know, sometimes when we do these uh, high-risk, complex, unstable patients, we, I mean, I think less is more in those situations. Yeah. But if it's a stable, elective patient, that I'm more willing to go back. But otherwise, like, uh, like what, what our other panelists say, I might just, you know, if it looks good, just leave it be. Dr. Obanai, any um, other approaches as different? Um, no, I, I would just leave it too. Um, you know, kissing bottom may disrupt to the well expanded stand. If there is a, a pre um, or baseline IBUS of circumflex, that, you know, the finding might be helpful to uh, make a decision. How about Dr. Kumara? Any comments? Yeah, I think I agree with the panel. Uh, the, the results look good. The branch is small. Uh, doing a kiss may be if it was a bigger vessel. In this case, the vessel is small. It's okay to just stand across and leave it be. The results are good. I would like to ask the panel if it was a sizable vessel. So, so sorry, uh, Dr. Visible, uh, circumflex. So sorry, uh, Dr. Kumara, I can't hear you at all. Uh, I think your system is very, very unstable. Yeah, now better. Oh okay, something wrong with the internet connection here. Sorry. No, I, I totally agree with the panel. I would uh, do the same. I wouldn't want to disrupt the integrity of the stent. Uh, but I would like to put the question forward back to the panel. If it was a, a bigger vessel, a big side branch, a 3-0 vessel, would you then uh, decide to open up the struts a little bit or would you just leave the struts across the, the ostium? Of the large I think the same principle of I just, I, I, I just leave it. If the, if the side branch looks okay, then just leave it, whether it's 3-0 or 3-5, it shouldn't really matter. Um, I personally point, would. Yeah. 
Also, if you look at the OCT data from Akasaka, uh, he points out how when you try and cross into the across the stent struts into the circumflex, you won't always be able to displace the stent struts because you can have two overhanging struts over the circumflex. You might just get them huddled together. If you're lucky, you only have one strut that's overlying the ostium of the circumflex. You can displace it and open up the ostium of the circumflex. If you have two overhanging struts, you may not be able to displace them anyway. And that happens in about 30% of the cases. So that doesn't always work. And there's always uh, recently five-year data in track intervention last month showing that cyprans rotation in the circumflex doesn't really need any benefits in five years. Um, so generally, uh, whatever the size, I think is best to leave it alone. So the, I, I Thanks, Raj. Uh, oh, uh, do you want to put the Ivers on a bigger screen? Yeah. Uh, Cliff, can you unmute uh, the CAFLAB now? So I kept the uh, CAFLAB muted. Hihua, uh, we'll come back to you to make some comments now. Uh, can you unmute the CAFLAB, please, Hihua? Yeah. So this is the IVERS pullback uh, co registration with Volcano, and you can see that. Distally, I think it's still a bit under expansion. Probably we can go higher. And uh, you can see over here, it's not too bad, the stand expansion. I think the area of interest will be the Austeal LED and the left main. Uh. So here, I think we can uh, perhaps uh, expand a bit bigger. Do you have the MLA measured? I, I know it's a bit of a rush, but it does look uh, very good though. Yeah, I, I mean, if you ask me, this is as close yeah. to a perfect result as uh, I would like it because you had very heavy calcification. You have uh, done your uh, homework very well with uh, tractomy, with shortwave balloon, and noting that there was eccentric nodular calcification there as well. I think if you go for really circular perfect result, you may be asking for trouble though. You already had a yeah. 4-0 balloon that stuck in and dilated. Would, would, would anyone yeah. really try to optimize this further? Uh, Fahim, maybe? I, okay, I okay. think so. Distally, distally, you have eccentric expansion, but the area is over five. So I think you're pretty good there. Uh, the proximal edge is perhaps a little under expanded. You know, uh, it's sort of floating in, in a relatively normal vessel, but that's easy. I think you just take a 4-0 and you know, get to the edge and pop it open. But the areas look really good. I mean, uh, again, for fellows, eccentric expansion, while it's not ideal, is sometimes the best you can get. And what determines long-term clinical outcomes is the... Did we show them? Uh, yeah. yeah. So I think this is pretty good. So right here is what I'm, my concern is, you know, the very proximal... Sorry, sorry. Edge look, Show them I was again, sorry. I, I agree. Um, edge is a little under, so you yeah, it's, uh, it's but not that's easy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I think maybe both edges of the stand we will post a yeah. and then get a better uh, uh, expansion and MSA. Yeah. But I think this KK? is a great result. Otherwise, you know, considering what you started off with. But I think KK, it's a great what? result. Um, the the remaining touch up book isn't. It, it's not a. It's not a big deal. Um, you you are going to go back in anyway. But the, the key part, which is that the bifurcation looks great, uh, I think you have done the necessary prep work. And uh, like you, you know, the, some of these eccentric calcium, uh, as long as the, the stand is uh, fairly circular, especially at the bifurcation, I think you have a great result. So uh, I agree with Jack that this is about as good as you can make it. And I wouldn't uh, strive for, you know, uh, what looks like, uh, you know, how they call it, uh, uh, I don't know, an infinity ring circle. I mean, that's asking for trouble. Okay. Um, the last comment from uh, Nick, perhaps uh, looking at the result and this case and you delivered a lecture on that, yeah. what would your recommendation be for DAPT in this okay. case? So this is a patient who is not high bleeding risk, right? Okay, this is a patient no. who, who had PCI under ultrasound guidance, under, under imaging guidance. So if you would follow the latest um, recommendations from the EBC in that algorithm, this is a patient who is low risk ultrasound guidance. It's not ACS, right? It, it's a stable, stable patient. So this patient may actually, according to the guidelines, can benefit from three months 
uh, shortest duration of uh, the APT. Of course, what kind of antiplatelet would you use? Would you use the more potent one like prosegrel or ticagular or just pain clopidogrel? Uh, that I think will depend on the clinical scenario. So any any time from three months to longer? Although I don't think people would use three months only for something like this. Uh, it's and not anyone would give extended debt for this case, or any everyone's comfortable with twelve months. Fahim, but I mean, I'll, be, I'll be honest with you that I have a slightly different view on the left main. If it's a well done left main with ibis guidance and good areas, you know, stentromosis is very very unusual and rare. It's a huge vessel, so I think over here if you wanted you know, truncated at, at three to six months, you'd be okay. I would still go one year if because that's just the standard of care. But a large left main stent like this with an area that's, you know, eight and a half to 10, I think you're, you'll be okay even if you trunc truncate earlier. Okay, and for him, would you use clopidogrel or, or one of the more potent ones? I'm, I'm quite happy with clopidogrel unless it's like, yeah. a, you know, STEMI or, you know, bad ACS. I mean, I'm quite happy. It did, depends on the patient's uh, bleeding uh, profile. I wouldn't, you know, I use ticagalor for the bifurcation cases where, you know, there, it was really complicated and there's a lot of metal and those kind of situations. Uh, here, I think that clopidogrel would be probably okay. So, no, uh, Cliff, uh, uh, your... Yeah, uh, Hiwa, you're now uh, live again. Uh, do you have okay, any sure. other parting words for us? Yeah. No, I, I think uh, the experts have spoken uh, very well. I think uh, we're just happy to show a case today from uh, Tan Tok Singh. I think very, thank you very much for the kind invitation. And uh, hopefully, so thanks, uh, uh, yeah, we, we all learn something from each other. <laughs> no, no, definitely. And uh, it's, it's my pleasure to congratulate you for a case really very, very well done. And uh, I'd like to just uh, hop back to our objective here. I think uh, Hiwa really showed us really the correct uh, objectives of choosing the right patient for provisional left main PCI. Yeah, and yeah. he really demonstrated the tips and tricks of choosing it. And um, it was really a case where he prepped the lesion very well. He actually had a good read of what needs to be done before implanting stents for a perfect provisional approach. And I, I really want to thank uh, the three speakers for sharing with us the current advances, the data, the practical approaches to a provisional left main uh, PCI. So I, I really learned a lot from the panel as well as the participants who dialed in with their questions. And I'd like to thank everyone for their time, particularly those who call in to stay two hours with us. So again, last thanks last to the to help. team and congratulations <laughs> no, uh, for a job well done. Uh, and Jason. Thanks a lot, everyone, and uh, take care. Thank you. Goodbye. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Bye.